This video is brought to you by Wix. What's up guys, Jared again. Today we're finally addressing a movie that has plagued our comment section for what seems like forever, Donnie Darko. Now over the years, we've tried to tackle this head scratching movie from almost every angle. We wrote a full script for Earthling Cinema and another for a Philosophy Up video, but nothing ever panned out. Donnie Darko became a Sisyphean task. We did the research, wrote the scripts, to only delete it all and move on. But we couldn't just give up. This movie is a cultural phenomenon. One might even say it inspired a whole generation to appreciate independent film. So it behooves us to ask, why did this film resonate on the level that it did? Well, with the help of our new format, Half Baked, we think we can finally lay this movie to rest. So join me on this slightly confusing literal journey through time in this Wisecrack Half Baked edition on Donnie Darko. And yeah, the film's almost 20 years old, but hey, spoilers ahead. But before we get started, I want to give a shout out to our sponsors over at Wix. Right now, you can build your own professional website for free using their easy to use templates. Last year, I created a website for my voiceover work. So let me show you how I did it. I was creating a website for myself and I wanted, well, not a business, not a blog. I wanted a, there we go, portfolio and CV. And lucky for me, Wix already had template options for anything you might need. So of course I chose voiceover artists. So I just picked the design template and followed their instructions. And now I've got a professional looking site to send to potential clients. So if you want to step up your game in the new year and create your own website for free, go to wix.com slash wisecrack or click the link in the description to get started. And now on with the show. First, a quick recap. Donnie Darko takes place in 1988 Middlesex, Virginia, a quiet upper class suburb. Donnie, a high schooler, is woken up by a mysterious voice in the middle of the night. He wanders halfway across town and learns this. 28 days, six hours, 42 minutes, 12 seconds. That is when the world will end. More worrying still, when Donnie stumbles back home the next morning, he finds it ruined. A jet engine crashed right through his bedroom. Donnie then spends the rest of the month stumbling through some weird shit that culminates in him saving the world by going back in time. He does this by, well, we don't know. But it involves listening to this terrifying imaginary bunny, Frank. Did Frank tell you to do these things? I have to obey him. He saved my life. <laughs> I have to obey him or I'll be left all alone. In following this supposed master plan, Donnie does some crazy stuff. He floods his school, burns down a pedophile's house, and takes his girlfriend Gretchen on a Halloween date to an old woman's cellar door. But shit goes down and Gretchen is accidentally run over, leaving Donnie to face doomsday alone. When the fated day arrives, a wormhole opens up over Donnie's house and he watches from afar with Gretchen's body. What happens next? Well, time travel, I guess. Donnie wakes up in his bed 28 days earlier, laughing because he succeeded in going back in time. In doing so, he saved Gretchen from her automobile fated death and his family, who was on a plane going through that wormhole. Then, right on cue, the gen engine comes crashing down and kills Donnie. Meanwhile, the rest of our cast is left feeling oddly connected, as if somehow vaguely aware of Donnie's sacrifice roll credits. Now, if the details left you scratching your head, don't worry, you're not alone. Donnie Darko is such a rapid fire succession of ideas and themes that it can be a bit difficult to analyze. Now, is there a grand philosophy to the film? Well, here's what we came up with. Idea one, world lines and Graham Greene. Early on, the film draws parallels between Donnie's journey and that of The Destructors, a short story by Graham Greene taught in Donnie's English class. In the story, a gang of London street kids set their hearts on destroying an old man's home down to the very last brick. They start by dismantling the interior, then destroy all the valuables and flood the foundation, before finally they bring the walls themselves down. Surprisingly though, the boys aren't doing this out of hate. As Donnie explains, Well, they say it right when they flood the house and they tear it to shreds that like uh, destruction is a form of creation. So the fact that they burn the money is ironic. They just want to see what happens when they tear the world apart. They want to change things. This idea of destruction as an act of creation is critical to understanding Donnie's journey. After all, Frank's master plan pretty much amounts to a bunch of senseless destruction. When it's all said and done, Donnie floods the school, burns down a home, and gets at least two people killed. But the film also heavily implies that everything Donnie did was absolutely necessary to go back in time and save the world. 
Now, it's not exactly clear how. I mean, in the new universe, the pedophile is still at large, but the director's cut leads us to believe that he was using destruction to create the conditions upon which the wormhole would appear. It does this by first telling us the story of T, the short story's protagonist, whose plan seemed faded. It was as though this plan had been with him all his life, pondered through the seasons. Now, in his 15th year, crystallized with the pain of puberty. Then it draws a parallel between T and Donnie by showing us this surreal moment of the film. I'm gonna get a beer. Yeah, as Donnie later figures out with the help of his science teacher, these weird bubble path things were actually a visualization of the future. Well, each vessel travels along a vector through space-time along its center of gravity. Like a sphere. I beg your pardon? Like, like a spear that, that uh, comes out of your chest. Um, sure. And this is where the film draws on actual science. These spears, as Donnie calls them, are a real concept in physics. As physicist-philosopher combo David Deutsch and Michael Locke would explain, your life forms a kind of four-dimensional worm in space-time. The tip of the worm's tail corresponds to the event of your birth, and the front of its head to the event of your death. An object seen at any one instance is a three-dimensional cross-section of this long, thin, intricately curved worm. The line along which the worm lies is called the object's world line. By being able to see his world line, meaning his own position in the past, present, and future, Donnie knows what he needs to do to make the time machine. Of course, you might be wondering if Donnie being able to see his future is a logical contradiction. After all, if the future is written, doesn't that mean we have no free will? And props to the film again, it gives a shout out to this idea. Well, you're, you're contradicting yourself, Donnie. If we were able to see our destinies manifest themselves visually, then we would be given a choice to betray our chosen destinies. And the mere fact that this, this choice exists would make all preformed destiny uh, Come to an end. Now, it's hard to say that Donnie is contradicting himself when he says that knowing the future is compatible with free will. As philosopher David Lewis explains in his groundbreaking paper, The Paradoxes of Time Travel, our definition of possible changes based on how complete our set of facts is. For example, not knowing my future self, it's possible that I could mount a bid for president in 2024. But let's say I did know the future and that Bauer 2024 never happened because I'd rather watch movies and play Red Dead. Well, knowing this fact about my future, I would be right in saying it's not possible I'd run for president. Now, importantly for Lewis though, my knowledge of the future wouldn't limit my free will in the present. Just because I know I'm more likely to play video games than run for president, doesn't mean the universe would cosmically conspire to stop me if I tried. There won't be glitches in the matrix if I try to mount a bid. In the end, it's not that future me couldn't run for president, it's that present me knows that future me doesn't run for president because there's just too many legendary animals to find. All that being said though, does the film explore the conflict between free will, time travel, and foreknowledge? Well, not really, and that's why we couldn't really make a definitive thesis in our prior attempts. Honestly, it feels like the film has all the building blocks for some super deep philosophical insight, but never quite puts them together. Instead, Donnie talks about changing his world line like this. Not if you travel within God's channel. God's channel. God's channel. While there are a boatload of God-fearing scientists, by citing a transcendental, all-powerful being in the argument, the film changes the topic from the physical to the mystical. And sure, on the surface, this comment might not make a whole lot of sense, but the film is actually tapping into something much deeper here. Idea two, quantum physics and the director's cut. Now, God might seem like a weird idea for Donnie to toss around, especially considering that much of the film is a not-so-subtle critique of upper-class conservatism and their sanctimony. Nobody cares about responsibility, morality, family values. Mm -hmm. But that all depends on which version you watched, the theatrical release or the director's cut. While the theatrical cut is a good deal shorter, it also omits, for better or worse, a lot of writer-director Richard Kelly's world-building. Particularly in the director's cut, you get excerpts like this from Roberta Sparrow's book, The Philosophy of Time Travel. Yeah, so to summarize, Donnie's story takes place in a tangent universe which is about to blow. That is, unless Donnie stops it in 28 days. In setting up Donnie as the messiah, or living receiver in the film's lingo, the movie gives him some weird powers and some even weirder eyes. Donnie then saves the world, returning the tangent universe to the primary one. 
While that might all seem like some random stuff that Kelly just made up, he's actually drawing on some pretty deep ideas here. After all, Donnie isn't just time traveling, he's time traveling across parallel universes, which, based on your choice of philosophers and physicists, is possible. Physicist Hugh Everett, for example, was famous for coining the idea of a multiverse as a way to explain wave function collapse in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, before being observed, a particle exists in a superposition of states. For instance, a photon acts like both a particle and a wave until you try to look at it, and then it makes up its mind about being either one. The act of observance somehow forces this indefinite state to collapse into a definite state. How? Well, there's no real answer right now, but Everett theorized that these collapses don't really exist at all. Instead, when we observe a particle, we're observing a symptom of the universe splitting, as both states are realized in different realities. What this means for us is that there are nearly infinite branching realities running alongside our own. So does that mean a universe could exist that was cosmically doomed, such as Kelly's tangent universe? Well, likely not. Unlike media's newfound obsession with multiverses, this fry is your universe. It's soggy, it's weird, it's gross. And this delicious normal fry is my universe. Everett's theory of the multiple worlds doesn't invalidate the basic laws of physics. Parallel universes aren't going to collapse into each other, but that doesn't necessarily rule out Donnie's time travel adventures. How is that possible? How is time travel possible? Now, I know that might sound weird to say that time travel is possible, but it lies within the film's very specific depiction of the idea. Maybe some of you have heard of the grandfather paradox, which states that backwards time travel is impossible because then you could kill your grandfather and then you wouldn't exist, so who goes back in time and kills your grandfather? By invoking parallel universes, Kelly completely sidesteps this logical problem. Killing your grandfather would just make a parallel universe where you don't exist. Like the grandfather paradox, how could a bullet-holed Frank be able to warn Donnie about the world ending if Donnie went back in time and saved it? Well, if Frank was from a parallel universe, then it all checks out. And if you think we're reaching here to explain away some inconsistencies in the film, I don't think so. Remember those world lines we talked about earlier? Physicist Kurt Gödel proved that a universe could hypothetically exist in which these world lines were actually closed loops. That means by going forward in time, you could end up in your own past, kind of like your future self lapping your past self in Mario Kart. And while our particular universe is not constructed this way, various physicists have proposed how these closed time-like curves could theoretically exist, like physicists John Wheeler and Kip Thorne, who believe these Mario Kart track timelines could be generated using wormholes. And again, Donnie Darko does throw this idea out there. According to Hawking, a wormhole may be able to provide a shortcut for jumping between two distant regions of space-time. But while the movie alludes to all these weighty ideas, in the end, everything comes back to Kelly's weird mythos. Sure, Donnie and his teacher talk about science, but then Kelly explains everything away like this in the director's cut. Water and metal are the key elements of time travel. Water is the barrier element for the construction of time portals used as gateways between universes at the tangent vortex. So no science, no real discernible philosophy or belief system, just Kelly's unique brand of mysticism. And yeah, certainly not enough to really flesh out a philosophy of video. Idea three, the verbs. So here's the big question, Wisecrack. Why is this film such a cultural milestone? Why do people point to it as a really profound movie? While I can point to a lot of things like the great cast and amazing soundtrack, for me it comes down to how well Donnie Darko functions as an exploration of upper middle class angst. From its depiction of teenage sexual frustration to baby boomers struggling to understand their child's mental illness, the film is an incredible exploration of growing up privileged in the late 80s. If any of you have ever lived in suburbia, you know how frustratingly appearance focused it can be. Take Mrs. Farmer, for example, a parent and teacher who's obsessed with her own moral crusade. I want to know why this filth is being taught to our children. Throughout the film, we see Mrs. Farmer constantly judge and belittle others for not subscribing to Jim Cunningham's BS self-help advice, especially Donnie's more liberal mother. Our paths through life must be righteous. I urge you to go home and look in the mirror and pray that your son doesn't succumb to the path of fear. Of course, Mrs. Farmer is never concerned about being truly moral. Despite her idol Jim Cunningham becoming a convicted pedophile, Mrs. Farmer still holds on to her steadfast belief in his moral system. 
Proving how righteous she really is, Mrs. Farmer insists on going to Jim's trial instead of taking her own daughter to a televised talent show, and then shamelessly guilt trips Donnie's mother, Rose. Rose, I have to appear at his arraignment tomorrow morning. And as you know, the girls are scheduled to leave for Los Angeles in the morning. Now, as their coach, I was the obvious choice to chaperone them on their trip, but... But now, you can't go. And this is where the film really succeeds. It shows us in stunning detail all the annoying trappings of middle-class suburban life, and then gives us a voice in Donnie to speak out against it. After all, there's something viscerally relatable to Donnie standing up to all the ridiculous expectations placed on him. We've all wanted to stand up and say no, like Donnie did when he rejected Jim Cunningham's ridiculous system. You can't just lump everything into these two categories and then just deny everything else. And to that end, Donnie's acts of rebellion and even destruction feel kind of acceptable. He floods the school, sure, but that's the same school that fired his favorite teacher for daring them to think for themselves. I don't think that you have a clue what it's like to communicate with these kids. And we are losing them to apathy, to this prescribed nonsense. He burns down a house, but hey, the owner was our aforementioned pederast. Eight-year-olds, dude. In the end, these acts of rebellion function as a form of escapism to us, the viewers. As Freud once paraphrased his fellow psychologist Theodore Fontaine, people cannot subsist on the scanty satisfaction they can extort from reality. We simply cannot do without auxiliary constructions. In other words, fantasy and wish fulfillment are necessary to keep us happy and functioning. And to that end, Richard Kelly's weird world building, complete with superpowers and time travel, acts as the ultimate form of escapism from suburban monotony. What if, like Donnie, you actually were the center of a tangent universe and it was up to you to save it? For me, those thoughts would at least make all those white picket fences a little more bearable. So what do you think, Wisecrack? Did we spend the last few years missing an obvious angle on Donnie Darko? Is there a more philosophically deep and consistent thesis that we've missed? Or are you in our camp and think that what makes the film so great is how it channels our middle-class edgelord angst? Drop us a line in the comments section, and if you want to build your own website for free, check out wix.com slash wisecrack. Peace, guys.